Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. I hope that you are having a wonderful, wonderful day and ready for a wonderful weekend and a wonderful episode too. I also hope that everyone here in the UK is enjoying the weather right now because it's truly extraordinary. And of course, around the world, wherever the sun is beaming, I hope that you are taking advantage of those rays. And I hope that you are well. Welcome back to the revamp podcast, Utter Truth with Hayden Appleby. I would like to apologise first and foremost for missing the episode last week. I had a mini family emergency, let's say, but all is good now, all is sorted, and I am back with the stories that we need to discuss because this is, of course, the place for true news, for uncensored and often investigative and independent journalism free discussion and conservative right-wing commentary on the week's most pressing matters on what matters most and expose on that where you can regularly end your week. And oh boy, do we have an interesting episode today as we look at the breaking story, the breaking news of AstraZeneca right now, which is finally, for some people, withdrawing its COVID vaccine from the international market, plus potential Trump vice president, maybe she's not so much anymore, Christy Nome is the focus of a lot of controversy right now after she has revealed in a book, in a memoir, some might say, that she killed her dog. So let's talk about that. Was it a fair decision? Also, Russell Brand has finally at last been baptised. And there are certainly a lot of public figures right now who are also turning to Christ and amidst the world's evil that we are constantly seeing being exposed, awakening to the truth is necessary now more than ever. And it really does light me up to see his experience. So we're going to discuss that Plus, finally, a hot take at the end of the episode, of course, about the constant far-right narrative. Isn't everything that was previously common sense now being labelled and conveyed as far-right? Yeah, let's talk about that too. Let me tell you, it's a tactic used by tyrants. That and even more this week, coming up on Utter Truth with Hayden Appleby. Okay, everybody. So here we go. This is the story that everybody is discussing in the US, or at least they were last week, as Christy Nome, who many have been hinting could have been an option for vice president, could still be an option for vice president for Donald Trump in 2024 if he were to be successful, has essentially suddenly become the target of mass controversy coming from all, and I do mean all, across the political spectrum. It is not just those on the left. So let's just say last week was not her week, and she has been since trying to ferociously defend herself and defend her actions. So what are those actions? actions, or should we say, what were those actions, and why is she subject to controversy? Well, Christy is the South Dakota governor, and she has a new book coming out, like a lot of politicians right now, in the lead up to the 2024 election, titled No Going Back, The Truth on What's Wrong with Politics and How We Move America Forward. And inside this book, people began to notice a strange section of one of the chapters where she essentially describes how she shot and killed her pet dog who was arguably still a puppy and then callously killed a goat by putting them beside gravel pits and shooting both animals. So at first it was kind of weird to a lot of people on the X. People were like, what? This is very random. What a weird section of the book. And then it actually blew up massively and she has been all over the mainstream media trying to defend what happened as Republicans and Democrats have been outraged 
by it, have been devastated by it and by the description of it within the book. So that is why we are discussing it, because it is important. Because ultimately, her intention in telling this story appears to have been to portray herself as this tough woman, this iron lady, you might say, able to make the hard decisions in politics but it's kind of backfired because instead it has split all her supporters and conservatives in half. So all sorts, no matter their politics, are condemning her for this. But why did she do it? You might be wondering, like, why did she shoot her dog? It seems a bit random. What is her reasoning? Well, that's a good question. And basically, it's because the dog, who was called Cricket, was a pointer dog and he was apparently, allegedly, super difficult to train, so had killed two chickens belonging to Christie's neighbours, something which could have held Christie legally liable, it appears, and the dog had allegedly tried to bite her. So, isn't that wonderful? And of course, even if this is the way it sounds on the surface, and the dog was a little bit dangerous, a little bit reckless, it wouldn't warrant, at least not in my opinion, shooting the dog in the head next to a gravel pit. But it isn't even really as simple as it sounds on the surface. There is a little bit more to this. You see, it seems that the entire purpose of getting Cricket, of having him as a puppy, was for him to be a hunting dog. This is what she wanted. She's always lived on a ranch, and she admits herself that she wanted him to kill pheasants. So the dark kind of irony here is that he kind of fulfilled his purpose. While everyone is rightly condemning her actions, not many people are acknowledging that Cricket kind of did what he was supposed to do. He killed another animal, right? And she wanted that. She was training him to kill pheasants. He just didn't kill the type of animal that she hoped he would. So clearly he needed training. He needed to be trained that, no, I want you, Cricket, to go and kill this animal. She seems obsessed with murder, doesn't she? I want you to go and kill a pheasant, not a chicken. But instead of getting trained, what he got was a bullet in the head because he misbehaved, essentially, and was, quote, untrainable. That's actually a quote from the book. She didn't train him. She gave him a bullet. She gave this dog a bullet. A bullet in the head of a domestic animal because he was hard to train and had killed two chickens. Does that sound fair to you? Maybe you can start to see and sense from this discussion what my perspective on it is. Especially since she is now attempting not to apologise for what happened, no, to rewrite the narrative, portraying the dog less as a misbehaving one, like she does in the book, and more as a dangerous threat. In fact, she claimed that the dog was, quote, extremely dangerous on Fox News. Also saying this. In your new book, it's called No Going Back, Uh you include a story about shooting your dog, despite your team telling you not to put that in the book. I have to say the decision didn't go down well. To include the story about the dog, it's not gone down well. Many people are questioning your political future. Well, I don't think you have the facts straight. Um, This was a vicious, dangerous dog that was a working dog. And I had to make a choice between the safety of my children and an animal that was killing livestock and attacking people. So it's included because a lot of politicians run from the truth. They they try to um, hide from tough decisions. It was a very hard decision for me. It It was was 20 years ago. Was it a puppy? No, it was an adult working dog. It was an adult working dog that was attacking livestock. 14 months old. And and, uh, killing livestock. The dog was 14 months old. It was a year and a half old, the dog was, yes. Yes. Do you think it was good politics to include that story? That has been a story that's been out there for years, Stuart. People, my political opponents have used it for years. So I want people to know the truth on it. Yeah. She also kind of goes on to say, quote, you know how the fake news works, Gnome told Fox News. Quote, they leave out some or most of the facts of a story. They put the worst spin on it. And that's what happened in this case. I hope people really do buy this book and they find out the truth of the story because the truth of the story is that this was a working dog and it was not a puppy. 
it was a dog that was extremely dangerous. Ah, I see. So, essentially, she's trying to twist this. She's trying to twist it, in my opinion, into some kind of fake news, far left, deep state psyop propaganda that she's facing. You know, it's the deep state coming for her to target her because she supports Donald Trump. It's propaganda. While at the same time as doing that, she's promoting her book. So, yeah, very, very clever there, Christy. And what she's also doing there is she's claiming that that Cricket was not a puppy despite a 14-month-old dog either still being one or just passing the threshold of puppyhood, if you like. But this is clearly an attempt, in my opinion, to create less sympathy, you know. He's a working dog. He wasn't a puppy. Then you can get the American people to feel a bit less sympathetic for Cricket because he was just a working dog. So it seems less sad and she can kind of try and salvage her reputation a little bit. But Christy, this is not some plan to take you out. This isn't the deep state coming for you. At least I highly doubt it. It's just you admitting something pretty unethical that you did. The idea that this was some wild, dangerous dog that was a threat to her and her children, which she is now trying to claim, is ridiculous to me. At least it seems ridiculous to me based on what's been described. In fact, in one of the most sad parts of the story that you yourself, Christy, write in the book, she describes how her young daughter essentially came home from school one day and asked, quote, hey, where's Cricket? Now, if Cricket was a safety risk for her family and for her children, then why in God's name would the girl come home looking for him? like her companion. If he was this big threat, surely the children would be afraid of him, not come home looking for him like the puppy that he basically was. To me, the whole thing basically stinks of Christie twisting the narrative to try and salvage some support that she has now lost and kind of forming a massive loss in her family unit in the process. But if you still believe that this was actually about protecting herself and her family, this potential Trump vice president, then I think that her true intentions and her true sense of character is seemingly revealed in the part that people are talking about less, which is actually the killing of the goat. And this is because there was much less reason for killing the goat. And there is this great article that I'm actually going to read from briefly, which I think sums it up. And it's kind of philosophical as well, if you like, from NC Newsline, which does seem like quite a leftist progressive journalism site, but it really summarizes the issue up well, I think, the issue that has divided so many all across the political spectrum. The title of this article they wrote reads, quote, Gnome's dog killing was bad but to really understand her, consider the goat. And the writer goes on to say, quote, After Gnome made the death march to her farm's gravel pit, where she shot Cricket, she was apparently still in an uncontrollable rage. Walking back up to the yard, I spotted our billy goat, Gnome wrote. The nameless goat's only sin in that moment was being in Gnome's field of view. In the book, Gnome tried to justify her snap decision to kill the goat by writing that it, quote, loved to chase her children and would knock them down and butt them, leaving them, quote, terrified. The animal also had a wretched smell. But apparently none of that had been a big enough problem to do anything about it. Not until Gnome got angry enough to kill a dog and decided she needed to kill again. Gnome says she, quote, dragged the goat to the gravel pit, tri- tied him to a post and shot at him, quote, shot at him, it says in this article. But the goat jumped when she shot, quote, my shot was off and I needed one more shell to finish the job, she wrote. She studiously avoided saying she wounded the goat with the first shot, but that's the implication. Not wanting him to suffer, she added. 
apparently experiencing her first twinge of feeling after saying that killing the dog was not pleasant. Quote, I hustled back across the pasture to the pickup, grabbed another shell, hurried back to the gravel pit and put him down. Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. I think that sums it up quite well. There seems to be less of a vibe with that in particular and with the whole thing, I think, of self-defence that she really didn't want to have to do. It was just this act of self-defence and it seems to be more of an intentional murderous rampage. She just went mad and wanted to start killing stuff because of this dog. So what is really going on here? Well, Christy Nome literally wrote I hated that dog in the chapter. And the goat story not only reflects a disturbing lack of self-control, but it also raises another question of law. So she certainly has not helped her career in any way, shape or form here because it was an unethical act of animal abuse, especially when it comes to the manner by which she did this. So there's a reason I'm vegan, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) It's because animals, like humans, have the right to life and to be free from this. There's a lot of people, especially on the right, who who think it kind of makes you woke to be vegan and to admit that to people. But woke and vegan are not synonymous, my friends. And suggesting they inherently are is just as bad as Christy suggesting this is some left-wing plot to take her down when she continues to defend her actions, and has now said that Biden's dog should also be euthanized. That's right. She's she just keeps on going. The the murderous rampage is continuing and has seemingly not been learnt from. It's like I said earlier, a bit of a death obsession. She admitted, quote, I guess if I were a better politician, I wouldn't tell the story here. Well, yeah, and if you were a better person, you wouldn't have done it in the first place, I would say. So this is all an attempt to portray herself as tough, to portray herself as this woman America needs, this great make America great again style woman. But it's not going to work. In fact, I think it's already failed. If anything, this doesn't show that she can make tough decisions. It shows that she makes drastic decisions too quickly and carelessly. And she would be a mess, I think, with foreign policy and with protecting the American people. Because what happens if she just gets in one of her rages again? So, some advice to Trump. In my opinion, I wouldn't pick her. Because we don't pick animal killers for vice president. Especially not those who then wear their killing as a badge of pride. And conservatives, please, let's not support her. But look, don't let this make you lose your faith in humanity or in the safety of animals on this planet. Because a dog in Nebraska actually survived a tornado the other day. And has since been named the Flying Dog. So let's end on this message of hope. The Hindustan Times reported that, quote, This is Zeus. He miraculously survived a tornado that tossed him across his neighbourhood in his crate. When it tore through his town in Nebraska last week with maximum wind speeds of 165 miles per hour, Zeus was inside his kennel. Isn't that wonderful. What a nice message. There are still safe animals in this world and miracles do still happen. Just not when Christie's around, clearly. Is it finally happening? Will Big Pharma finally be held accountable for the harm they and their products have caused? I ask you that today. Because I have some good But also some slightly, mostly good, but slightly anger-inducing news today, my friends. After Big Pharma are in trouble again. But who is going to pay for their troubles? Well, massive, massive news over here in the UK. And internationally, actually. After renowned and controversial pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca has 
withdrawn its COVID-19 vaccine worldwide, only a few months after admitting that it can cause severe side effects and blood clots in some cases, as if we didn't already know that. So, I'll be amazed if you haven't seen this because it's massive and it's being reported by literally every single news outlet and media company in the world. Even the mainstream ones that have happily lobbied for Big Pharma for the last few years. Some examples of those who have reported it include Channel 4, The Independent, The BBC, The Guardian, Sky News, The Daily Mail, The Telegraph, The Conversation, Reuters, The Financial Times, The Times of India, The New York Times. The list really does go on. Everybody is talking about this and it comes after the organisation withdrew its European marketing authorization with the European Medicines Agency issuing a notice on Tuesday this week that the vaccine is no longer authorised for use. Now, if we read this from The Independent to give us a little more context, quote, AstraZeneca is withdrawing its COVID-19 vaccine worldwide, months after the pharma giant admitted the drug could cause very rare but life-threatening injuries. Hmm. The British-Swedish drug maker has already withdrawn its EU marketing authorization. That's what we just discussed for the vaccine. Branded Vaxzeria. I hope I didn't butcher that name, since 2021. And the authorization is the approval to market a drug in the EU's member states. The withdrawal was due to a, quote, surplus of available updated vaccines against new variants of the novel coronavirus, the company has said. It goes on a little bit more to say how AstraZeneca continue to claim their vaccine has saved many, many lives and was a miraculous thing, basically. So this is what is being claimed by AstraZeneca and this is what has happened. So essentially, they are claiming that the reason for the withdrawal of the jab is the availability of new COVID vaccines that are going to be even more efficient and even more effective than their one, with the uptake of their vaccine dropping and therefore it no longer being necessary. But it seems rather strange to me that that would be the only reason or even the primary reason for this. And that is because this is all happening just months after The Telegraph dropped the bombshell that AstraZeneca, the viral bombshell that AstraZeneca was facing lawsuits claiming that the vaccine was, quote, defective all the way back in November last year, which I covered on this show. It was a whole segment I looked at as they said that the supposed, quote, triumph of the vaccine was, quote, undercut by tragedy. Again, that is according to The Telegraph. Then in January this year, it was reported that AstraZeneca was, quote, facing one of the biggest battles of its kind, end quote, with an 80 million COVID jab compensation claim. And again, according to The Telegraph, lawyers taking 35 cases to the high court, quote, with up to 40 expected to follow. Then, a week ago, The Telegraph followed up on this few-month-old article, writing that, quote, AstraZeneca has admitted for the first time in court documents that its COVID vaccine can cause a rare side effect in an apparent about turn that could pave the way for a multi-million pound legal payout. The pharmaceutical giant is being sued in a class action over claims that its vaccine developed with the University of Oxford caused death and serious injury in dozens of cases. It goes on to say, quote, 51 cases have been lodged in the high court with victims and grieving relatives seeking damages estimated to be worth up to 100 million pounds. The Daily Mail claim that it could be up to 250 million. 
So that's good. And they should be seeking even more, quite frankly, because AstraZeneca has, after all, made billions from this COVID crisis. But despite all of this, despite the controversy of AstraZeneca, despite the lawsuits and the media claims, the Telegraph reports, despite AstraZeneca's vaccine being claimed to have been defective, they are suggesting and they are maintaining the platform of their major pharma company by arguing that it's just a commercial decision. It's just because new vaccines are coming. Yeah, sure it is. Of course, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the blood clots tainting their reputation and threatening them legally. Sure thing. If you think that it's more of a coincidence, then you are a conspiracy theorist. And that's their message. That's the message of the mainstream media. And that is not the message I am going to be endorsing here on the show. It is wonderful news for all the people who have been harmed, killed and or bereaved by these jabs and then regularly shut down by the establishment because they do exist. Whether you like it or not, they do exist and it is wonderful news for them and they deserve to know about it. But there is an element of this, despite of course the wonder of it, Despite the good news for those who have been harmed, there is an element that provides the kind of bitter side of the bittersweet breaking story. And it's a thing that a lot of people don't know about and that has casually been ignored from many reports, which is the fact that AstraZeneca was actually granted indemnity from prosecution by government ministers back when they planned to release the jabs a few years ago, meaning that any compensation they will have to pay will in fact be paid by you and I, by the British taxpayer. Can you believe that? Because I couldn't. I I really couldn't. But because they were granted emergency use, Not only did it mean that the jabs themselves and their nature as being virtually experimental was ignored, but also that the pharma company can't really be sued, or that if they are, we are forced to bail them out. Did you vote for that? Did you get a say in whether or not you bail Big Pharma out when they're finally held accountable? No, neither did I. Neither did anyone. But the big... Fat cats in Downing Street, (laughs) yeah, they did. They were okay with that. At least many of them were. And Big Pharma, I'm sure, love it. It is insane. Hypothetically, for YouTube purposes, the jab could have killed literally millions and they'd still be free from prosecution. If you think that is right, then there's no help for you, quite frankly. Because if a crisis means that you are free from consequences, no matter what you do, no matter what effects you create through your products, then surely that just means that they, the establishment, can simply continue to generate states of perpetual crisis because it lets them off the hook. Because it means they can get away with anything. Such an idea is, as I keep saying, utterly insane. And so that is the bitter part of the whole ordeal and of the news coming out right now about AstraZeneca, as well as the fact that they can just now admit it, that they can withdraw the vaccine from the market, step back. And my question would be, what happens to all of those who were censored, who lost their jobs for daring to speak out about this, to speak the truth because of mandates? who have been targeted by authoritarianism of the time, such as Alex Mitchell, who I'm so grateful to have had on my show, who lost his leg because of these people, and then AstraZeneca goes and blocks him on social media while YouTube removes our interview from the platform, censors him? What happens to him? Does he get an apology? The censorship that caused real harm? 
people literally, according to Alex, ending their own lives because they are being gaslit by Big Pharma, censored by Big Tech, and told that it's not happening at all by the government? What happens to them? Do they get an apology? Where is the apology? Well, personally, and I think with many of them, they're not looking for an apology, but we're looking for accountability. We're looking for justice. And so we will continue to peacefully stand up for it and to demand it because it matters. And you know what? To kind of conclude this discussion, this vital discussion, despite being told that we were the ones spreading misinformation, despite being censored over and over again, there were actually real so-called celebrity doctors who were in fact doing so. There were real mainstream media outlets that were doing so. We had doctors and media articles suggesting that jabs were 100% effective, something which is objectively false, 100% safe, something which is wrong, false, scientifically. It's absurd that they were even able to release that and then accuse us of being the conspiracy theorists. And in fact, courtesy of Lawrence Fox and others, whom I thank for sharing this, feel free, I would love it if you could, take a look at some of these examples of media lies and, ironically, of disinformation. So there we are. Will there be any regret from these liars? Will there be any apology? Who knows? But what I do know is that we must continue to stand up for what is right and we must continue to demand justice because I do believe that it will come. Because as all of this is happening, the Mail Online has actually reported that, quote, Pfizer agrees to settle 10,000 lawsuits accusing pharma giant of hiding cancer risks of heartburn drug Zantac. So there is corruption massively throughout all of big pharma. Like I have said before, it is literally a mafia, but gradually, one step at a time, it is being exposed because it's not just AstraZeneca. The corruption spreads wide, but that's why I'm here. That's why there are so many who are standing up because we want to expose that and we want to talk about what needs to be discussed. And I do think that there's hope. I do think that the sweet outweighs the bitter because a lot of people are waking up now. And while there is still a lot of corruption, as I said, one step at a time, we will hold those who need to be accountable. Okay, on to our next point of discussion, one that I'm really culturally interested in having, because I know that some people come to the show and they just want to hear me talk political corruption, they want to hear me talk manipulation, free speech, social issues, give certain perspectives, but not so much hear about religion and hear about faith and spirituality. 
but I am a Christian and so it's an important part of my life. It's the most important part of my life and I think it's more necessary than ever now and it's being discussed and it's happening a whole lot more now than ever and when there is something in relation to it happening, I will certainly be discussing it. And boy, is there a lot happening right now, because there is a literal Christian revolution. The number of people turning to Christ in the alternative media space, in politics, in the public eye, full stop. It is enormous. And boy, do I welcome it and think that it is necessary. So why and how am I making this observation? Well, many have noticed that Russell Brand has been discussing Christianity a lot more lately. He's made Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis the focus of his book club. He's been doing all sorts of reels, discussing Christ and discussing God, discussing biblical scriptures. He even prayed the rosary on a literal Instagram reel and so much more. And he is, of course, a guy who is a massive focus in the alternative media space, who has done a lot of good, it seems, certainly, through his content, exposing people and and standing up for the truth, offering fresh perspectives. And he even has pinned videos now on his Instagram profile when they were previously different pins regarding Christianity, videos about faith. So here are some examples, if you will, some great discussions and videos Russell has done recently over the last few months about the Christian faith, delving into it. Take a look. The natural image of Christianity is an image of suffering. In the world of positive thinking, well-being, it's a lot of self, self, self on the shelf, 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 isn't it? There's a lot of encouragement to continually be working on your state, I find, in order to make yourself happy and content. Isn't one of the great values of religion that we learn to use suffering to grow? What atheists will say is, no, that's just so that, you know, you're offered pie in the sky, treasures in heaven so that you become more pliable here on earth. That's not the type of Christianity that excites me. The type of Christianity that excites me is the idea that we can, through surrendering ourselves, become conduits for a great power. And can you tell me in the chat, it seems to me that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ was pretty radical when it came to confrontations with power, a willingness to say things that are challenging. If indeed we are emulating Christ, is it somehow inherently political? Is this the time for Christ to be summoned to earth? Not that you can summon God, I recognise that, but for us to summon at least the Christ within ourselves, to embrace our suffering as an opportunity to grow, be willing to give up self-satisfaction in order to generate change. All the time in our content, we're talking about change and politics and corruption and hypocrisy. Is this the perfect example that we've been looking for? Has it been right in front of our faces? The good God made the world. Why has it gone wrong? And for many years, I simply refused to listen to the Christian answers to this question because I kept on feeling whatever you say and however clever your arguments are, isn't it much simpler and easier to say that the world was not made by any intelligent power? Aren't all your arguments simply a complicated attempt to avoid the obvious? <laughs> that's, such, that's such a good way. That's like, now like, that's a good way of putting the atheistic argument, isn't it? But, you know, this book's not called Mere Atheism. And we've got this left. Yeah, there we go. So beautiful and I'm so happy as we will discuss that he is having this discussion and welcoming it more and more and there's another thing ladies and gentlemen that has opened up this discussion for Russell Brand because at the weekend just gone he actually got baptized this took place on Sunday I believe and this is a clip of him reflecting on the experience on Instagram the day after it took place. Take a look. Today I got baptised and it was an incredible profound experience and many of you will have had your own experiences of baptism and will therefore know what I'm talking about. Many aspects of it were very intimate and personal. 
The truth is this, as a person that has in the past taken many, many substances and always been disappointed with their inability to deliver the kind of tranquility and peace and even transcendence that I always felt I've been looking for, something occurred in the process of baptism that was incredible, overwhelming, literally overwhelming because I was obviously underwater and it was the River Thames at some points. So I felt changed, transitioned. Now, of course, even though it's been less than 24 hours in the interim period, I've already felt like sort of irritation. I've got three children. I've got a job. I've got challenges. I still live in the world. But I feel as if some new resource within me has switched on. So many of your comments have been so beautiful and encouraging, and I really appreciate it. And also even the cynicism, I understand, because some people will just see me as a celebrity. I don't see me as a celebrity, because I was me when I was a little boy. I was me when I was a junkie. I was me when I was poor. I've been me in all of the different phases. But I recognise that anything in this terrain, in the sort of social media world, could be exploited and utilised. For me, I've made the decision. And I know what the decision is. I've made it for myself and I pray that it will be relevant to my family, in particular, my children. My wife's Catholic. You know, she's already made her own choices in this life, including this one. This is new for me. I'm learning and I will make mistakes. But this is my path now. And I already feel incredibly blessed, relieved, nourished, held it's been an incredible experience. I wish I could tell you exactly about it because there were amazing individuals involved. There were incredible and bizarre incidents that took place that felt serendipitous and laden. You know, I do a show every day. I'll be talking about this stuff in the show because it's part of my mission and it's part of my ministry and it's part of my service. This is new to me and it's a joy to me. And I know that I'm not expected to be perfect and I know that that's not something I'll be able to deliver. Those of you that have embraced me, I'm so grateful. I can't tell you how happy I feel and how relieved I feel. But as you know, if you know, my resources are coming from somewhere else and someone else now. Thank you so much for your support. Let's keep doing this together or certainly I'm just going to do what I'm doing. I love you so much. I'm so grateful to be surrendered in Christ. Oh my goodness. If he'd have put a proper piece of music to that reel, it could have brought tears, quite frankly. This is my path now and I already feel incredibly blessed, nourished, held. Wow. He really does feel fulfilled now. You can see it in him. You can see it in the way he talks. That's what happens to so many people like myself when they turn to Christ. But this isn't it. According to the Wall Street Journal, which Russell actually discusses in a recent video when he's talking about his newfound Christian faith, more young people than ever are admitting a belief in a higher power. And so many public figures are too. For example, Candace Owens, who has always kind of been a Christian, it seems, at least for several years, but she had a massive event take place recently after having been fired from the Daily Wire for, in my opinion, daring to report the truth about the Middle East conflict. She tweeted this, saying, quote, Recently, I made the decision to go home. There is, of course, so much more that went into this decision and that I plan to share in the future. But for now, praise be to God and his gentle but relentless guiding of my heart toward, capital T, truth. Quote, she then adds a scripture. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. End quote. I do not fear. Christ is king. And she adds a photo there of her confirmation into the Catholic Church with supposedly, allegedly, one of the best priests in this country because she actually got confirmed over here in the UK, it seems, which is awesome. Welcome, Candace. And Candace herself also congratulated Russell on his baptism recently, saying in a tweet, quote, just learning that Russell Brand is getting baptised. This is amazing. God is at work. Difficult to put into words the spiritual urge I felt last year. An overwhelming understanding that it was and forever has been a holy battle of eternal good versus evil. End quote. So there we are. Lots of great 
Christ experiences in regard to Candace lately. And she is bang on. This is a spiritual battle. And around the same time, over the last couple of months, Tammy Peterson, who is the wife of renowned Dr. Jordan Peterson, has also been confirmed into the Catholic Church, as has Eva Vladinder Brook, who has been essentially a great influencer fighting for farmers, for freedom against the WEF, against illegal immigration, mass illegal immigration. She's great. Tucker Carlson has been conducting more and more interviews based on Christianity with priests, based on those kind of topics. We've had all the Christ is King stuff trending on Twitter. There has just been a lot, like a lot of Christian vibes and a real Christian revival, I would say, going on. It is incredible because truth wins and Christ is the truth. And there is clearly a sense of revival and potentially revolution going on right now. And some people aren't happy with that. It's just the fact of the matter. Because the devil is at work in the world. But I, hopefully, am going to offer some implications as to why that might be. Why people are unhappy and also why the revival itself is taking place. As well as my personal experience with Christ. Because I feel this is vital and we have to discuss it. So I believe, essentially, that the world is like a magnet. That the more evil gets exposed day by day, and it's certainly happening as we've seen today a little, the more people feel an innate spiritual inclination to flee, to turn away from that evil and move towards objective goodness. And that objective goodness is Jesus Christ. He is the pinnacle of goodness. He is the pinnacle of spiritual divinity because he is the son of God living and ever-present in the world. So this is my explanation. The more we see the sinister array of corruption, especially people like Russell Brand and Candace Owens who are right in the middle of that media storm, the more they and we want Christ to hold us, the more we want to feel his greatness. The love of Christ really is the solution to the evil in this world and it's attractive to people because of that. Now, some people are not as much of fans of this kind of idea, such as David Icke, who Russell Brand has acknowledged lovingly and who has been very loud on Twitter questioning this. Like a lot of Russell's followers who are, you know, they preferred it when he was a little more new age, when he was a little more interested in the occult, in tarot than praying the rosary. But he's woken up and there are genuine concerns that people are making. There are genuine points that David Icke was making that are perfectly fair. Because when you're anti-establishment, I think, you often want to run away from things that seem establishment-y, from things that seem like institutions. And many assume, oh, that must be the church. But it's not about the church, It's not about specific priests. It's about the glory of God. And David Icke has kind of raised the point, it seems, that religion and the history of the Catholic Church has led to wars. It has led to conflict. Of course, there has been paedophilia when it comes to certain priests, all of which is absolutely awful. But you know what I always think about this? I always think you cannot correlate that. In fact, I'm going to come out on a massive whim and say that religion itself innately has never started a war. It has never started a conflict because it can't. It's a thing. It is human beings who do that. Let me give you an example. Mozart's musical instrument. I think it's a great example. And it goes like this. If somebody, if a musician, let's say, plays a piece of Mozart's music, but they play it poorly. They play it really badly. It sounds horrible. It damages the ears of the audience. Would you then blame Mozart for that? Would you blame Mozart for the way in which this musician played his wonderful song? No. And in the same way, you can't blame Christianity as a thing, as a religion, as a faith, 
for the way in which flawed human beings have misused it in the past for the behaviour of specific so-called priests. You can't do that. It doesn't work. The idea of the church is to act as a spiritual base, place established by the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ for believers. It's not about what specific individuals have done in the past or how they've misused and abused it. And so you can't go down that route. It's a logical fallacy. If anything, it is evident of the sin of humanity, the fact that there have been religious wars. It is evident more that we need a saviour. And I think that is what Russell is feeling. It's about the glory of God. It isn't about organised religion, like people say. It's not about the church as an institution. It's about Jesus Christ. And you want to know something? He was about as anti-establishment as they come. So let this be my message to my loved ones, my friends, my viewers who are not as sure why I kind of discuss this. Please, don't just turn away from it because you hear the stigma of the word religion. Because it's Christianity and you want to be a free flying bird. In fact, Christianity is freedom. It's the ultimate freedom. Because it's the freedom that Jesus Christ gave on the cross. And so why did I choose that freedom? Why did I turn to Christ? Well, I would say save this video if you're ever confused. And you know what? If you want me to discuss this in more detail in a bigger video, a 40-minute video going through the evidence for Christianity, I'll be perfectly willing to. Hit the thumbs up button and let me know. But I've been going to church for a few months now. And I hopefully will also be baptised soon. That's been in the works for also a couple of months. Hopefully I'll get it done this summer on a bright sunny day as it's coming through the stained glass when I hit 18 at the end of the month. But it is the attraction away from evil that really sparked the idea of Jesus in my mind. But then it is the evidence for Jesus the evidence for the existence of a God, the idea that you can't believe in morals if you don't believe they've come from God. Where else do they come from? Where else can they possibly come from? The idea that the world can't just come from nothing, that's a logical fallacy. Someone, some kind of transcendent creator has to push the first domino. Some force has to push it for all the dominoes to begin falling. This evidence that is so conclusive, I believe, of a divine God, the evidence for Jesus, his life, even atheists who acknowledge that he lived, and the evidence for his resurrection. All of this stuff reinforced and brought me closer to Christianity, not because I don't believe in the truth, but because I do and because I believe it is the truth. These aren't just academic discussions, they're ways of life. And so, there is a reason that so many American conservatives, so many truth seekers and big pharma conspiracy theorists are Christian because we care about the truth. And when you look into it, it is the objective truth. And that might offend people because truth offends people. <laughs> Boy, have I learned that. But it's not about your truth. It's not about my truth. It's about the truth. And based on the evidence, I and billions of people on this planet believe that that truth is Jesus. And so, David, your questions make perfect sense. Your questions about why so many people are undergoing this revival, they're perfectly fair. But this isn't just about upbringing, like he suggests. It's not just about culture. It's about moving towards the truth and moving towards goodness with all the evil that does exist in this secular world. Because look, agape, which is selfless love, it is the solution to the evil of this fallen world. Just think about it. How much less evil do you think there would be if people actually followed Agape, if people actually followed Christ? Do you think big pharma executives, the corrupt establishment puppets, the corrupt Uniparty, Benjamin Netanyahu, do you think these people would act the way they do if they really knew the love of Christ? Of course not. If they knew that love, they would be acting very differently. There would be so much less corruption, so much less greed, 
so much less and so many less lies. And you know, the other thing I've found since I have myself tried day in, day out to follow Christ, and boy do I fail at times, but I try. The other thing I have found is that since doing so, I am so much more fearless. And it's not because of me, it's because of him. I'm so much less afraid. Interactions that I never would have had in the past, things I would not have said to people that I've kind of had a bit more of the audacity to say, topics I've covered on the show that I really probably wouldn't have done or would have shied away from, things I've shared on social media. I'm just less afraid of the world and I'm more fearless since I followed Christ. And I think it links back to the scripture that Candace shared earlier, which is the do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And you see these great things on social media and everywhere that show how many times do not be afraid is mentioned in scripture. Because when you realize that it's God's judgment that matters the most and not the judgment of the world, then you really just stop caring and you start caring most about Christ and you start caring about the truth above any of the material things you can really gain. And that is where morality comes from. And it always links back to that quote I find. If the world hates you, then know that it hated me first. Because it hates, in my opinion, this is my little addition, it hates the truth. And so I'm going to show you this quick clip of Candace, of Candace Owens, so eloquently describing how God is the focus and how God, and when you fear God in a positive way, everything else just seems to matter less. The lies and the flaws of this world seem to matter less because you are looking at what is to come, toward what is to come. I am team God, okay? I'm team God. I do not fear the media. I do not fear journalists. I do not fear APAC. I don't fear big pharma. What I actually fear is God. I think that one day we are all going to have to account for the things that we have done and the things that we have said. And I want to make sure that I am not a person that is parroting lies. The fear of losing your job, encouraging some people to spit out lies, I don't think that works in the end, right? I think you've got to check your priorities. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? And I really have tried to present in this discussion in the best and the most articulate way possible, although I'm sure it's not as articulate as Candace Owens or Russell Brand with all their intelligence could be. But I hope that I have portrayed in an articulate way and opened in an intriguing way a discussion about this. And my prayer is that Russell's conversion, this discussion, will help all in the kind of alternative media and truth-seeking space to also turn to Christ or at least to consider it, to look at it. Because you're not a sheep when you're a Christian. What you're really doing is you are looking and seeking the divine Holy Spirit that you can feel leading you with conviction and you are listening to it. And so, of course, of course, you don't have to be Christian to listen to me. It's certainly not the only thing we discuss by any means. We discuss all sorts on this show in the pursuit of journalistic truth. But I wanted to discuss this today because it is more essential now than ever. And I think it underlies all things, acting as the solution to ultimately all of the things we do discuss because it is the truth. For he is the truth, the life and the way. And like it or not, no one truly, ultimately, in a fulfilling way, comes to the Father except through him. Okay, finally, because we are running out of time, but I do want to quickly look at this quick hot take that we've got today, which is a far right hot take. Something kind of amusing, I think, to end on, quite frankly. And I ask you as the hot take, is the far right, at least as the media portrays it, an invisible enemy? Is the far right really this big threat? This is the hot take that we discussed today as it is based on a headline from Politico, a manipulating, corrupting headline, basically. 
which they have actually changed because initially it was, quote, the far right's obsession with or the far right's plan to or something like that, make babies, right? And now they have changed the headline to something a little bit nicer, something that they know the far right won't be so outraged about, which is, quote, the far right's campaign to explode the population. So I'm going to read you a bit from the article to begin with, saying, quote, The threat, we are told here this weekend, is existential, biological, epo defining Economies will fail, civilizations will fall, and it will all happen because people aren't having enough babies. Though relatively small as conferences go, Natal Con has attracted attendees who are almost intensely dedicated to the cause of raising the US birth rate. The broader natalist movement has been gaining momentum lately in conservative circles, where anxieties over falling birth rates have converged with fears of rising immigration and counts Elon Musk, who has nearly a dozen children and Hungarian prime minister, among its proponents. Natalism is often about more than raising birth rates, though that is certainly one of its aims for many in the room. The ultimate goal is a total social overhaul, a culture in which child rearing is paramount. So the overarching narrative there and what they're discussing is natal con, a recent kind of event that took place in regard to falling birth counts. And they're essentially claiming that if you are concerned about that, if you are concerned about the birth rate in the US and around the West decreasing, you are far right. That natal con is just rife with far-right influencers and political commentators. If you have fears over that, then it's like some far-right Christian lunacy and you obviously want to start some Handmaid's Tale-style society where you are just dedicated to babies, babies, babies. But maybe that's not the case. Maybe we're taking a bit of a leap there, Politico. Because it's just common sense, I would have thought, that falling birth rates is a problem and it's something that should be talked about. But just like they say now that maths is racist, that fitness and that going to the gym is also far right, the list goes on and on. What they do, these media outlets, is they attempt to not only silence free discussion about important topics, but to divide and conquer based on normal everyday tasks like making babies. They attempt to portray you as far right if you have concerns. But we can't fall for this. We can't fall for this idea of divide and conquer. Because ultimately, it's not about us versus each other. It's about us waking up to the establishment and waking up to how they are continuously attempting to silence debate, just like they are doing here. Because as that old saying goes, it's not far right. It's just right so far. Plus, all you're going to do when you portray everyone you disagree with as far right, as racist, is you're going to desensitise the general public to those truly hateful people, of which there are not many. So let's stop creating these harmful, divisive narratives, please. Okay, everybody, I hope you've enjoyed the episode today. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the discussions we've had and the really important stuff, as always, that we have discussed. Please do support the show by hitting that subscribe button, that like, thumbs up, and by checking back in, of course, next Friday at the same time of 10 p.m., British Standard Time. I hope you have enjoyed. Please do consider some of the things we have discussed. Please do have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and enjoy the sun if it is where you are. But if it's not, enjoy it anyway, because life truly can be great. I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for watching and God bless you all.